Well, good morning and welcome to all of you in the room. And I also want to welcome all of those who are participating re remotely. Uh, my name is Stephanie Murphy. I'm the Director of the Division of Comparative Medicine within the Office of Research Infrastructure Programs, otherwise known as ORUP. First and foremost, I would like to acknowledge both the Office of AIDS Research and ORUP who are co-sponsoring this two-day workshop on the current status and future enhancements to animal models for AIDS research. I'm going to start off with some general housekeeping issues and announcements before we formally open the meeting. I need to disclose to all of you that the workshop proceedings and sessions are being recorded as part of the WebEx venue. So watch what you say. Um, <laughs> Please identify yourself when participating in discussions or asking questions during any of the meeting sessions as we have a scientific writer, Sally Possian, who is going to be putting together a workshop report that will be made available at the ORP website at a later date. For those of you in the room, please use the microphones so that our remote participants can hear you. We will have people moving around the room that will have cordless microphones that they can pass to you. Our remote participants are in listen-only mode just for the main meeting but not for the breakout sessions. So remote participants may submit questions by email or through the chat box during the WebEx. While these questions will not be answered in real time during the meeting, someone will be following up with them with you on your submitted questions. Those of you in the room, you can ask questions at the mics. Uh, for speakers and presenters, if you have not already uploaded your presentations, please see Desiree, who's over here, uh, during one of the breaks before your scheduled session. I just want to remind everyone that meals and light refreshments are at the expense of the attendees. A list of local restaurants has been included in your meeting folder so you know what your eating options are in the area. Other options include the hotel restaurant and there's a Safeway grocery store right next door that offers quick lunch options such as sandwiches, salads, and soups. Last but not least, restrooms are located just outside of the room and down the hall. If you have any additional logistical questions, we have staff available in the room at the registration desk and on online who can assist you. For those of you in the room, these individuals will have a red staff flag on their name badge. So if they have a red flag, they may be able to answer your question. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank all of you for your interest and your willingness to spend the next two days being engaged in session topics identified by the organizing committee and introduced by the speakers and panelists, as well as for your thoughtful contributions that you will all be making to the discussions throughout the workshop. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce the chair of the organizing committee for this workshop, Dr. Nancy Hagwood, from the Oregon National Primate Research Center, who will address the objectives of this workshop. Thank you very much, Dr. Murphy. And welcome, I want to add my welcome to everyone today. Thanks for traveling, many of you, to be here uh, quite, quite a long distance. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to speak on behalf of the rest of, of our committee, but first I'd like to just thank the um, organizing committee at NIH. I need to know how to advance the slides. Small technical glitch here. There we go. Uh, so listed here, in a, uh, especially I want to thank the uh, Office of Research Infrastructure Programs and the Office of AIDS Research for their funding support, and uh, Sherry Hill, Barbara Fred Fredrickson, Brigitte Sanders, Rod Atkins, Miguel Contreras, Desiree, who's uh, uh, helping us with technical aspects, especially today, uh, Lola Ajaya, Ajayi, pardon me, and Susan Chandran, uh, all of whom have been on all of our conference calls and have uh, helped to wrangle this workshop. Uh, I put in a few, um, uh, the alphabet soup that we are mostly accustomed to is uh, translated at the bottom. For those of you who may not be as familiar with these institutes, ORIP and, and DCM being the home of the National Primate Research Centers, which 
has a vested interest in the outcome of this workshop, uh, not so much in terms of supporting uh, primates, but in terms of supporting the science that the primate models have, have um, really um, moved the field forward. So before I get into that, I want to thank my co-chairs on the uh, conference organizing committee, um, Anne Cherudi, Vefa Franchini, Mario Roeder, and Francois Villinger, and the five of us working with the NIH staff work together to put this program together, and I thank all of you again for accepting our invitations to come. We tried to put together a, a very high-powered group of people who could talk clearly and with an expert's eye about the history of our uh, field, which is now 30-some years old, getting on to 35 years of experience with these models that we've been working with. And it's, uh, it's a rich past and, I think, a, a great opportune future because we, we know that, that we've learned a tremendous amount from these models. And what we'd like to do today is listed in our objectives about uh, looking for potential enhancements to the existing models and then asking ourselves, are there other things we could be doing in terms of models for specific HIV research goals and refinements to what we're already doing? Are there new or emerging models that merit further development and support? And this is particularly important for our NIH colleagues who are listening in or, or here in the room with us. Uh, and one of the most important aspects to today's and tomorrow's time is to look at new technologies for improving the support of animal models. And I think we're going to hear some exciting data uh, on that subject as well. And then finally, promoting and sharing of models and samples. And this is something that I think we can all do and improve, but we may need some better mechanisms to do that. So with that, I think I'd like to just, uh, again, welcome everyone, uh, encourage everyone to please speak up and, and discuss uh, during our breakout sessions as well as in question periods. And I'd like now to turn to introducing uh, Jeff Lifson, who really needs no introduction to all of us. But if there's anyone on the call who does not know Jeff, Jeff has been in the trenches with, uh, with uh, the, the model development from the very beginning of the discovery of HIV. And uh, he brings a unique perspective to our field in terms of his breadth and depth of understanding a technical, uh, pathogenic, and biological aspects as medical aspects. Uh, the irreplaceable Jeff Lifton. Thanks for <laughs> agreeing. Okay. Thank you very much, Nancy, for the inter kind introduction and uh, also the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to uh, address this group and, and address this series of uh, topics. Um, you'll note in uh, my title slide uh, that uh, I explicitly emphasize non-human primate models, plural, and I think that's uh, perhaps the most important take-home uh, message from this presentation, that there are many models, and it's not a question of which model is best, but it's a question of really understanding what the different models are, what their properties are, and uh, matching the model that you employ to the question that you're trying to address. Um, my charge for uh, this uh, presentation was given to me by Nancy. Uh, basically, my brief was to set the stage to emphasize the models that we have, why we have them, and where I see their strengths and limitations to sort of set the stage for the presentations to follow. Um, I'm specifically not going to talk about any of the mouse models. We've got Ming and Jerry uh, to talk about that. I don't work in those models, I, um, and we've got experts uh, to address them. I'm going to confine myself to non-human primate models. I want to get a, a couple of points established uh, philosophically from the outset. Um, you know, use of animals in research is an uh, important uh, part of biomedical research. It's also sometimes a controversial one. And I just want to make the point at the outset that while we fully acknowledge and respect the principles of minimization of the use of animals, including non-human primates in research, that they represent the best available experimental systems in which to address certain key complex biologically and clinically significant questions in AIDS research that cannot effectively be addressed in other systems. And therefore, I believe it's incumbent on investigators to make an informed choice on the best non-human primate model system available to them that authentically recapitulates the relevant biology of human HIV infection they propose to study and to execute those experiments as efficiently as possible with thoughtful consideration 
of the NHP resources involved. So that's for the underpinnings of all of the work that we do. What do we mean by a non-human primate model? So a non-human primate model, from my perspective, consists of a non-human primate species infected with a characterized virus under conditions that provide a sufficiently well-characterized natural history of infection to allow meaningful interpretation of superimposed intervention. And by a well-characterized natural history, I don't mean just the control group from the current experiment. Um, it drives me nuts when people talk about the uh, monkey model, um, implying uh, singular. There are many different models, and it's really uh, perhaps the most important thing is to choose a model that uh, recapitulates as authentically as possible uh, the biology that you're trying to study. Uh, why do we use uh, these models? Um, because of experimental control, as with any mo animal model. Um, compared to the clinical situation where you're typically dealing with someone and you either don't know when they got infected or you have to estimate or impute an estimated time of infection, uh, they're infected with whatever virus they were infected with that you need to characterize as constantly evolving. In these models, we can control exactly which virus uh, the animals are infected with. Uh, we know the route, the dose uh, of the virus, uh, and the identity of that virus. Uh, and we can choose a virus uh, to address specific questions. And as we'll hear in some of the presentations, that can include the use of designer viruses that uh, are uh, basically engineered to have certain properties that confer experimental advantages. We can pick the timing uh, of when we're going to infect the animals, um, and we can exactly time collection of specimens uh, to uh, those uh, time landmarks. And that includes longitudinal sampling of blood, other fluids, and especially tissues, including longitudinal biopsies that can be informative, up to and including uh, scheduled euthanasia and necropsies with collection of extensive necropsy tissues. There's also extensive interventional latitude uh, for preclinical evaluation to generate safety data as well as proof of concept data, as we'll uh, see some examples, uh, and flexibility in terms of the timing of treatment initiation, duration, and treatment discontinuation that would be potentially problematic in the clinical setting. At the same time, given all those advantages, it's important to acknowledge and consider the limitations. Monkeys are not little furry people. Um, and so I think it's important to understand that there are differences. There are immunologic difference, differences. Uh, there are practical differences in terms of the suitability of certain reagents uh, for non-human primate studies. And the viruses that we use um, are typically not HIV. Uh, for a variety of reasons, including species-specific restriction factors, HIV does not productively and pathogenetically infect uh, the monkeys that we use for our studies, and so we use different viruses, and it's important to remember that those viruses are not HIV, and uh, we need to keep that in mind as we're interpreting results. And finally, we simulate aspects of uh, biology, uh, but we have to remember that they are only simulations. So why do we use models? What is it? Uh, what do we use models for? Um, this is one of my favorite quotes about models from the British statistician and, and modeler George Box, and he famously uh, has said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And what he means by that is that we're not looking for a model to exactly uh, recapitulate every single aspect of the biology that we're trying to model. Uh, they're not individual little humans. They're not uh, infected with uh, HIV. Um, but we're trying to use a model to highlight a particular aspect of the biology and ask a specific question. And so there's no need, according to Box, to ask the question, is the model true from the perspective of does it authentically recapitulate every aspect of everything? Uh, because, of course, it's not. Uh, the real question is, can you use a model to address a question in a way that is illuminating and useful? Um, so now we get to the, the fact that in order to do that, we need many models. And, and this is uh, not from biology, but it's an example uh, from technology. Um, and the result of that is we can have a proliferation of models. And there's a tension between trying to develop new models and at the same time wanting to have interstudy comparability uh, to compare models and standardize uh, to, on a limited number of models. And I, I think the, the difficult uh, balance that, that the field needs to uh, maintain uh, is somewhere in between those extremes of a, extreme proliferation of, of models because we can't uh, afford to explore all of them. But at the same time, I'll just remind some of the folks that weren't around then that the last time this field uh, tried to standardize around a, 
a single model uh, that brought us uh, SHIB 89.6P and uh, several years of uh, fruitless uh, studies. Uh, because that turned out to be a model that was not well suited to addressing many of the questions that were being posed to it. So and when it comes to non-human primate models, it's important to remember one size doesn't fit all. Uh, quick background on, in terms of you know, how I got here. I've been involved in AIDS research for going on 35 years. Uh, this is actually the first uh, AIDS paper that I published back in 1984. And for the first dozen years or so, I focused exclusively on human HIV infection. Um, in uh, the early 90s, uh, some colleagues and I developed a technique, uh, one of the early techniques for monitoring viral load, and that led to um, some interesting uh, revisions of uh, paradigms of pathogenesis. And as a result of that, one of the people I was working at a small biotech company out in California at the time, and this fellow, Tom First, was also working there, and he had worked previously with Bernie Moss and Vanessa Hirsch, and he said Vanessa was doing a vaccine study, and she didn't get sterilizing protection with her vaccine, but she thought it, the vaccine had done something, but she couldn't prove it because the only assays she had were virus isolation and uh, P27, and they just didn't have the sensitivity or dynamic range to show differences between partially protected animals, she thought. She said, could you do, do one of those viral load assays for SIV? And I said, sure, why not? So we did, and that sort of took me from following the non-human primate AIDS model a field from the periphery to studying it, hey, there are a lot of things you can do in these models. I didn't realize we can ask questions that I've been interested in, that there's no way to really uh, get at these questions in, in the HIV-infected people that I've been studying. And uh, for the last 25 years, the predominance of my research has really focused on that. So all that by way of introduction. And so just to give you an overview of the presentation, uh, to try and meet the charge that uh, Nancy gave to me, uh, I've divided the uh, things into six topics that I think are important uh, within this field. And the approach I'm going to take is to very briefly review the state of the art, uh, make some quote, recommendations, and point out some future challenges. Starting with macaques, I think this audience uh, knows, but we've got uh, some mixed people uh, online as well. So the species that we use are Asian macaques. These are animals that are not naturally SIV infection, and their susceptibility to SIV infection was identified based on some accidental transmissions uh, going back uh, several decades uh, in the primate centers. And there's some uh, fantastic uh, uh, Revco uh, CSI um, uh, detective work that uh, Christian Petri and, and uh, uh, Preston Marks did to ferret out the history of, of all that. Uh, these animals are the mainstays for our studies of pathogenesis, transmission, prevention, treatment, and more recently, cure. Uh, there are different viruses that are used. The different viruses have different pathogenesis and different species of macaque, uh, in part because the different viruses have been adapted to different species. Um, and again, it's a question of picking the right virus and species combination for your study, and then benchmarking that uh, to um, uh, the question that you're um, asking. So. Indian origin rhesus macaques are the species that are most commonly used in the U.S. Uh, Chinese origin rhesus macaques are also used uh, to a more limited extent in the U.S. Pigtail macaques, uh, cinemologous macaques, uh, shown here in their guise uh, as they're known as long-tail macaques, and in their alternative guise of crab-eating macaques. Um, there's also uh, Mauritian cinemologous macaques. You can tell they're Mauritian because the Mauritian flag there. Um, <laughs> but, but these uh, are genetically interesting because of a founder effect from limited uh, uh, founder uh, stock on the island of Mauritius. And we'll hear more about that uh, later, that limited genetic uh, heterogeneity and immunogenetics are useful for some studies. Indian origin rhesus macaques are the hosts most commonly used for experimental infections. Uh, they're relatively available. There's extensive natural history experience with uh, many different various viruses. Uh, the immunological reagents, uh, including uh, both antibodies and also uh, for both uh, analytical work and in vivo uh, depletions, as well as uh, peptide MHC tetramers are available, probably most extensively for this species. And the genomic information in terms of both sequencing, especially annotation, is best developed for Indian origin rhesus macaques. With that said, there may be some studies where it's important to use uh, another uh, species. Uh, this is an example um, from uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, over the last uh, many years with uh, Theodore Hatsianu and uh, Paul Binas. Um, it turns out that in pigtail macaques, as, with, as within other uh, non-human primate species, uh, the TRIM5-alpha, uh, that is a potent uh, capsid uh, targeting restriction factor, 
That's one of the things that keeps HIV from productively infecting uh, rhesus macaques. Um, actually, in pigtails, uh, it doesn't exist as trim 5 alpha, but rather as a trim uh, cyclophilin infusion protein that does not restrict HIV, and therefore, we have been able to use that as a starting point to try and develop a minimally chimeric HIV uh, that, under certain experimental conditions, will cause HIV productive infection, pathogenic infection, leading to AIDS uh, in pigtail macaques. And you can see the depletion of the brown CD4 cells in gut, uh, as well as pneumocystis pneumonia and a uh, B cell uh, lymphoma, multifocal lymphoma, as uh, endpoints in this model. Um, I mentioned that the Mauritian sinos. Uh, have limited immunogenetic heterogeneity uh, from some pioneering work from Dave O'Connor and his colleagues uh, showing the limited heterogeneity. And we'll hear from Jonah uh, Sasha later in the program about how that limited uh, genetic heterogeneity uh, can be used for certain kinds of studies, including transplantation and, and other work. Um, well, not a, a focus of our own work, it is important to recognize that we've been talking about experimentally infected Asian uh, monkeys. Uh, now, turning briefly to African monkeys, the, uh, virtually every African non-human primate species that's been uh, carefully surveyed has an endemic SIV. Uh, most of these infections appear to have been in the population for extensive periods of time, such that the virus and the hosts are co-evolved. Um, so that uh, basically uh, the virus and the host have evolved so that the sort of highly pathogenic uh, consequences of the experimental infections uh, that we use uh, as models of highly pathogenic HIV infection in humans uh, don't occur in these species, and these species have developed various different mechanisms uh, for uh, overcoming uh, th these uh, processes, uh, and we'll hear about that from Jason Brenchley a little bit later. The main species that are used are city mangabees, uh, which are limited in terms of the, the types of experiments that one can do there because of their uh, protection status. And more commonly, uh, one of the uh, four to five to six uh, either separate species or subspecies of African green monkeys. And when the experts can't agree on stuff like that, I try and stay away from it as a non-expert. But uh, Jason uh, will tell you about some of his work understanding some of the mechanisms by which um, African green monkeys uh, manage to coexist with SIV. And some uh, another example of that is uh, showing some work um, from uh, Michaela uh, Mueller uh, Trutlin, uh, where uh, some of the differences in terms of regulation of NK cell uh, uh, trafficking and IL 15 expression uh, seem to potentially contribute to how African green monkeys are able to coexist uh, with their uh, SIV infections as well. Um, one of the other variables you need to keep track of with the macaques is age. Sometimes there are sort of specific purpose experiments where you need to pay attention uh, to that, and that's the point of the experiment. Um, and we'll hear from uh, Christina de Paris uh, later in the meeting um, about uh, studying uh, immune responses and, and viral infections in neonatal uh, macaques, infant macaques. Um, and uh, sex is also an important variable. Obviously, uh, if you're doing a vaginal challenge study, that you know, is one uh, thing where uh, that determines how you're going to address that issue. Uh, but at the same time, it's important to realize that immunologically and otherwise, there are differences uh, between the sexes, highlighting a couple of them here in terms of control of uh, uh, viral reservoirs and also uh, innate immune responses in HIV-infected people. So that's something else to keep track of. Um, in terms of the NIH guidelines uh, recommending that we have uh, balanced uh, numbers of uh, groups of both male and uh, female uh, animals in our studies, I think that's an important goal. I, see it as an aspirational goal simply because most investigators don't have the resources to do appropriately powered studies uh, for one uh, to do uh, both sexes at the same time and so in a careful way. And so I think that's something important to keep track of, uh, but often not practical uh, to do. So turning from uh, this uh, topic of the macaques, my recommendation is really pick the right species, age and sex to address the question at hand. And in terms of the challenges, uh, all of us that do this work are aware that animal availability and cost uh, can be significant challenges to uh, doing the work that we want to do. Uh, I want to turn to viruses now. Um, and uh, when it comes to the viruses, we have many choices to make. Um, that includes picking which virus, that is virus identity, uh, 
um, if we're doing a vaccine study, whether we're going to have homologous uh, matched the, using the same virus in the immunogen and the challenge virus, or a heterologous one where we're uh, intentionally mispairing them. Uh, when we're picking a challenge virus, we can choose whether we want to use a clone that's going to be homogeneous, which confers certain advantages, uh, or an isolate that contains multiple different variants, uh, which again, depending on the question you're asking, may be an advantage or a disadvantage. Uh, importantly, how those challenge stocks are prepared, uh, whether they're produced by transfection or infection, uh, can influence uh, how they behave, and that's important to keep track of. Uh, excitingly, as we'll hear from um, Katie Barr and uh, Brandon Keel, uh, some of these designer viruses in terms of uh, both shivs and also uh, sequence tag viruses uh, with barcodes and other techniques for tracking independent chains of unique chains of uh, infection events in vivo. And then finally, uh, we get to choose the route dose and the number of challenges that we use. Um, I think there's an important question uh, that the field as a whole has not done a great job historically addressing, and, and that is the characterization of our viruses. This is a study from a few years ago that Brandon Keel and Greg Del Pret and our group led, uh, basically collecting viruses, in this case all viruses that legitimately were labeled on the tube as CIVMAC 251, um, but they were prepared in different laboratories at different times, and we characterize those things. And uh, the paper goes into an extensive analysis of this. I'm just going to focus on Brandon's uh, genetic analysis of it. And you can see Ron DeRocher's original, the sort of uh, Ur uh, 251, uh, has two, a little over 2% uh, envelope diversity in that stock. Uh, CIVMAC 239, the infectious molecular clone derived uh, by passage from 251, is over here. Uh, 2766 is actually an a, a infectious transmitted founder variant, a molecular clone that Brandon isolated out of uh, 251. But you can see stocks from other uh, investigators have as little as uh, less than 1% diversity and uh, as up to uh, you know, none quite as diverse as Ron's original 2.1%. Now, does that matter? Um, well, it depends on what you're trying to do, and it can, and this is simply showing uh, the uh, extent of uh, escape mutations in certain protective epitopes in the different stocks. And uh, it's a little hard to read, but there's extensive variation from less than 5% uh, to you know, more than half uh, for uh, these stocks. So it's important to know what actually is in your stock. That's all things that were legitimately called CIVMAC 251. Um, this is a publication from a few years ago now that, that uh, got a lot of attention at the time, suggesting that alpha four, antibody to alpha-4 beta-7 uh, in combination with, in a complex regimen with uh, short-term antiretroviral treatment could promote um, long-term virologic uh, control. Um, the paper uh, noted that the virus used for that study was CIVMAC-239. Uh, very provocative and exciting results. A uh, clinical study was started. And we were asked to participate in a couple of different uh, studies uh, to try and uh, follow up on and, and reproduce those uh, results. And so uh, we did that. Um, and uh, Francois Billinger was kind enough to, as we were trying to exactly replicate the original study, share with us some of the virus that was used in that original study. Um, when we uh, did the work, in, and uh, including characterizing that virus uh, and using that virus, one of the things that uh, Brandon Keel discovered when we sequenced it is that that virus was actually not wild type CIVMAC-239, but rather it was uh, CIVMAC-239 with a stop codon in NEF, which is a well-characterized variant, um, but it hadn't been uh, described that way in the original publication. And when we submitted our manuscript, uh, Science posted this uh, expression of editorial concern uh, noting that fact. Um, subsequently, uh, those two papers and a, another paper uh, by Dan Baruch and a couple of other models uh, have been published. And we saw very different results than the original uh, described results. In particular, compared to our experience with CIVMAC-239, both the early viral dynamics and uh, the late uh, course of things were a lot more spread out uh, than normal. And we did not observe any difference in treatment groups uh, imputing any uh, beneficial activity of alpha-4 beta-7 antibody treatment. Um, in terms of understanding exactly why that was, that's uh, still not entirely clear. I think one of the factors that may contribute to that is that it was this nef stop virus. The virus with the stop codon in NEF has a nef minus phenotype, so it's an attenuated virus. And importantly, uh, this is Brandon's uh, sequence analysis of NEF. Uh, 
if you look at the gray, which shows the stop codon, at two weeks post-infection, you can see that the proportion of stop codon varies from 90% down to 0%. And the rest restoration of an open reading frame takes that from an attenuated phenotype to a wild-type phenotype. That variability um, is significant and correlated with early viral dynamics. Um, and when we look at five weeks, um, under selection pressure, because it's a stop codon and not a um, deletion, uh, it is uh, basically repaired and you wind up with 100% NEF open, but via different pathways and with different uh, amino acids uh, repairing that uh, uh, stop codon uh, with so far only very incompletely uh, characterized phenotypic effects. So I think that that's at least one of the things that accounts for the differential results. Um, Again, the journal has now corrected the original uh, publication as it, uh, reflected here. Um, and I just wanted to say, those of you that know me uh, fairly well know that I have a broad and deep enough anti-authoritarian uh, streak to, to say uh, I, I'm not going to tell other people you know, what they should do or how, um, but I think as a field it would behoove us uh, to pay more attention to these things. And this is just a modest proposal of basically a complete characterization uh, of any virus that's used in a non-human primate study uh, that we intend to make sure that uh, we are including in, in any of our future publications, and I'd encourage folks to be uh, doing that as well. I want to briefly touch on uh, new viruses because this is an important challenge. We'll hear more about this from uh, Katie and, um, and uh, also uh, from Brandon later, uh, but it's been uh, noted that uh, HIV envelopes um, typically don't interact uh, very efficiently with rhesus CD4, which makes sense. They're adapted to interact with human CD4, but relatively straightforward uh, point mutations, either at uh, position 375 in GP120 or at 281 in 120, can confer increased avidity uh, for interacting with CD4 and improved replication uh, from work that uh, George Shaw has done and work that uh, we've done with. Uh, uh, Theodora Hatsianu and, and uh, Paul Binash. Also, there's been a uh, trend to, for these chimeric SHIV viruses where we're trying to take advantage of uh, a virus that replicates and ideally is pathogenic in macaques but has an HIV envelope to serve as a target for neutralizing antibodies or other immunological reagents um, to rather than go with long-term uh, passaged viruses that have been used for many years to use uh, more clinically relevant uh, variants. Uh, including globally relevant uh, envelope uh, from Clade C and, and others, and, and to do that with transmitted founders, and we'll hear a bunch more about that. Um, an example of uh, these molecularly tagged viruses is shown here. In an early iteration, Brandon took advantage of some naturally occurring uh, silent mutations in uh, the integrase gene to come up with sequence distinct but otherwise isogenic and phenotypically equivalent viruses. What that means is that you can then track those by sequence in vivo in tissue samples and see which variant is where. Here in a vaginal transmission study, you can even do laser capture microdissection, highlight individual positive uh, cells, and figure out which variants are, are present uh, at those foci. Subsequently, he went from 10 variants uh, to, for other kinds of studies, inserting between VPR and VPX uh, a uh, 11, I mean, uh, 11. Uh, Put on uh, insert that's randomized barcode that allows you to track things in great detail with tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of different variants uh, to use next generation sequencing approaches to keep track of those chains. So when it comes to viruses, thoughtfully select and use the right virus for the question you're trying to address, and importantly, document exactly what that virus is. And one of the challenges that the field um, has to address is that when new and, quote, better viruses come along, um, it's a real challenge uh, and a real choice before an investigator is going to commit a couple hundred thousand dollars and a year or more of time and energy and effort to say, well, this new virus looks really good and I think it would be good for my study, uh, but should I use that where there's not so much experience um, or should I stick with Old Faithful that I isn't maybe as well suited to answer the question that I want to address, but but I know I've got 15 years of experience with it. So that's something that the field needs to uh, come to terms with. 
terms of pathogenesis, um, these models have been incredibly valuable for pathogenesis. This shows an early study from Ron Vesey, Andrew Lackner, and Ron DeRosier, Paul Johnson, uh, in which they documented that in gut, looking at CD4 cells on the x-axis of these flow plots over the first uh, few weeks of infection, you basically get virtually complete elimination of CD4 cells uh, in the gut, and that's associated with damage to the uh, intestinal uh, epithelium that in turn is linked to uh, microbial translocation and chronic immune activation that doesn't completely uh, uh, subside even uh, when the viral replication is suppressed with antiretroviral therapy. That's at least in part due to loss of certain key populations of cells that appear to be irreversible and required for uh, maintaining biology. Um, I had always thought that uh, basically uh, all of these processes were a consequence uh, of infection and loss of uh, integrity in cells, uh, but some work from Dave O'Connor and Jason Brenchley uh, nicely showed that uh, this process actually contributes to acute pathogenesis. And uh, interestingly, following uh, the monkey work, a recent paper from Eric Hunter and his colleagues suggests that this may have a clinical correlate and that limitation of um, uh, viral replication and associated intestinal damage uh, in HIV-infected people um, is associated with lower levels of uh, immune activation and pathogenesis. Um, I think this is an important uh, area for future research. We still don't fully understand it, and I think that's at least part of the reason why um, we haven't been very effective at uh, doing anything about it in terms of treatment interventions. Uh, this is a somewhat encouraging study from uh, Mirko Paradini and Jason, uh, Guido Silvestri, and uh, other colleagues, uh, Luca Vici, uh, the first author on it, uh, where a combination of exogenous IL-21 in the setting of suppressive antiretroviral therapy helped to restore some of those populations that are otherwise irreversibly lost, uh, Th17 and uh, Th22 cells, uh, resulting in reduced in gut and peripheral immune activation and uh, a decrease in uh, persistent virus. So when it comes to these pathogenesis studies, it's important to validate that the uh, model that you're using uh, recapitulates what's known about the in vivo pathogenesis uh, in the human setting. And, and I think, uh, as for many of these things, uh, close communication with clinical colleagues and sort of an iterative correlative assessment, or as I always like to tell Steve uh, Deeks at UCSF, a leading clinician, uh, thanks, Steve. I, I'm glad that you saw the same thing. I always feel better when our findings are replicated in another primate model. Um, turning to prevention, and this is an area that has, these models have been incredibly valuable. Uh, this is simply showing an example um, using a shiv uh, as a target for a broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibody and simply showing in a study from Al Martin and colleagues, Michelle Neeson-Zweig's antibodies, um, that a single injection of antibody can provide uh, relatively durable uh, protection over a period of time um, from multiple repeat challenges, um, and that uh, modification of that antibody with the so-called LS mutation to enhance its uh, uh, persistence and de uh, decrease its uh, clearance, improve its half-life, uh, results in more extended protection. Um, so that's an exciting uh, kind of observation uh, that provides uh, proof of concept for this approach and uh, helps people feel better about going to the clinic with them. Uh, it's even more true when you're dealing with a more exotic uh, kind of uh, reagent. In this case, um, Mike Farzan's uh, ECD4IG, uh, which shows uh, really potent uh, protective activity against Shiv Challenge uh, and also has some interesting uh, therapeutic activity. Um, it's not just for humoral uh, passive prophylaxis. Uh, active cellular immunoprophylaxis, and we'll hear later in the meeting from Lewis Picker about a really unique vaccine uh, based on using rhesus CMV as a persistent viral vector. Um, it's a really fascinating story. Um, I think while to some extent this may have started out as a, 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 study, a series of studies that, that were going to uh, basically test the safety, immunogenicity, and protective activity of a novel vaccine platform, it's turning out to provide all kinds of fascinating insights into aspects of cellular immunology that I uh, and I think most of the field had no idea uh, were part of how the immune system works, let alone can work. Um, and so you'll hear more about that later. And then uh, finally, uh, there is this uh, context-specific uh, 
both immune and non-immune uh, prevention uh, studies. Uh, this is a study, again, from uh, Christina de Paris, uh, trying to address an important clinical problem, co-infection with TB and HIV, uh, with a combination vaccine that underscores uh, the trickiness and the distinct features of um, vaccination um, in uh, infant macaques. And then that, that kind of thing also is, is relevant to non-immune uh, prevention methods, in this case, a combination uh, intravaginal ring uh, microbicide uh, contraceptive approach uh, pioneered by Nina Darby and her colleagues at the Population Council. So I, I think when it comes to prevention, uh, these models are valuable for assessing safety and importantly demonstrating proof of concept for novel, promising, but unproven and potentially risky approaches. And that can provide a rationale that gives people uh, the courage to try and pursue things clinically as well as the uh, data to overcome the, the hurdles uh, that would otherwise be in the way of uh, questioning that. I think the real challenge is, is that these studies take time, uh, they cost money, and uh, depending on exactly what the intervention is, you can get caught up in the argument back and forth of, well, should we require uh, non-human primate studies before advancing to the clinic or not, the so-called gatekeeper question. Turning now to treatment. Um, I, I think uh, this is, you know, when people say, well, what, what, what have macaque models, non-human primate models contributed to treatment? Because the antiretrovirals, the drug companies developed those, and, you know, what do the macaques have to do? Um, this is a study um, from the early 90s uh, from Bobby Black and colleagues, Chei Chen Tsai. Um, this is a study of basically um, PrEP and PEP uh, using uh, PMPA. And the reason I'm showing it is several years ago, I had a conversation with Norbert Bischofberger, uh, who was then at Gilead and uh, centrally involved in this work. And Norbert said that, you know, they had in license PMPA, they had tested it, they loved the in vitro potency, uh, but they were going to give up on the drug and abandon it um, because it had near zero oral bioavailability. And it was these results showing activity in vivo in a macaque model that convinced them, you know what, this drug is too good to throw away. We're going to develop an orally bioavailable prodrug, which is where uh, TDS came from and went on to become, you know, one of the most widely used antiretrovirals alone in combination uh, in the field. So that's an important landmark in the history of development of antiretrovirals. Here's another example, again, of uh, demonstrating proof of concept, the original study uh, from uh, Chastity Andrews and uh, Marty Markowitz, uh, looking at cabotegravir showing uh, durable uh, protection from a, a depot time to release long acting antiretroviral. Um, it's been a challenge in the field to come up with regimens uh, that uh, achieve comparable levels of suppression on a routine basis uh, to what's achievable in the clinic these days. But uh, over the last few years, we finally started to develop some regimens that do that, and that's very important and valuable for studies of our reservoirs, persistent uh, virus, and uh, so-called cure studies. Uh, and then there's a continuing role for non-human primate studies for evaluating novel antivirals, uh, including uh, new uh, RT inhibitors like EFDA. Um, immune therapy is also something that can be evaluated. This uh, shows some results from a study we've been working with George Pavlakis and his novel heterodimeric uh, IL-15 uh, for several years, um, and uh, showing uh, some results in terms of the biological activity, in terms of the immune modulation, uh, mobilization of T cells uh, to B cell follicles, um, and uh, some antiviral effects, and similar work uh, with the related engineered form of the molecule, uh, what was then called Altor 803, and now has a different name. Uh, and so I think this is a, a novel molecule where uh, looking in an animal model, provide some safety information and proof of concept in terms of activity. Um, when people talk about delivering antibodies, uh, even with the engineering, it can be a daunting task to maintain therapeutic levels. People are interested in using various different vectors to deliver antibodies and other uh, passive immunoprophylaxis agents, um, including a lot of work with adeno-associated viruses. Um, a major challenge has, that people are still trying to overcome is a development of anti-vector immunity that can compromise uh, activity. Uh, this uh, slide simply shows uh, an example of how well this approach can work uh, in Ron DeRosier's hands in an animal where they didn't develop anti-vector immunity, maintained levels, and basically kept an animal suppressed for years 
uh, from a pathogenic shiv infection. So again, I think the recommendation here is that these models have an incredibly valuable uh, role for demonstrating safety and proof of concept for these kinds of novel, uh, promising but unproven and potentially risky approaches uh, and provide a rationale uh, and the data that allows things to go forward to uh, clinical uh, evaluation. And the considerations and the challenges are much the same as in prevention, the cost and time involved, as well as, you know, is there a legitimate role uh, for a go-no-go no -go decision on a particular approach uh, that requires testing in a non-human primate model. I know philosophically from my perspective, um, if there was a suitable non-human primate model available, I would want to know the results in that model before I advance something to the clinic, uh, but that's just me. And to complete the presentation, uh, I want to talk about one other area that over the recent years has gotten a lot more of attention and people starting to develop models. That is targeting the virus that persists despite uh, suppressive antiretroviral therapy, uh, the so-called persistent viral reservoir uh, that is important for so-called cure studies. Uh, just focusing on one aspect of that, uh, we know that one of the places uh, when under circumstances of immune control or antiretroviral therapy uh, that virus persists is in uh, infected uh, T follicular helper cells and B cell follicles. In a progressor animal, you can see infected cells in the T cell zone in the follicles. In, in this case, an elite controller, you can see that the little bit of virus that is present is restricted to the follicles. Um, seemed like one of the reasons that might be the case is because in their normal biology, uh, CD8 T cells uh, that have antiviral activity and can clear infected cells from other locations normally don't traffic to B cell follicles, at least in part, because they lack the CXCR5 uh, chemokine receptor to follow the CXCL13 chemotactic signals to enter the follicles. Um, we took a simple-minded approach uh, in a study that Dave Ott led and simply transduced cells with CXCR5 exogenously and asked did that allow them to traffic to the follicles when they normally wouldn't. When we co-infused untransduced cells labeled in green with transduced cells labeled in red here, uh, roughly comparable uh, numbers, we saw extensive localization into the B cell follicles of the transduced cells, but not the untransduced cells. Uh, which barely got to the lymph node, let alone into the follicles. And more recently, we've combined this approach with um, uh, transduction with uh, CXCR5, the co-receptor, and also SIV-specific TCRs, and are able to demonstrate that in black, the cells do get into the B cell follicles and are associated with uh, significant apparent decreases in levels of virus in those follicles, uh, some nice RNA scope work uh, from uh, Claire Delia uh, shown there. And finally, uh, one of the last things that become apparent in terms of understanding viral reservoirs is that there are uh, clones of uh, infected cells that have identical proviruses. These clones expand over time. Um, and because uh, many of the proviruses, especially in chronic infection, uh, have deletions or hypermutations or otherwise defective and not replication competent initially, People thought, well, that doesn't, probably doesn't matter. Um, but it turns out that a significant fraction of those uh, expanded clones, a significant fraction of the replication competent proviral reservoir actually uh, is in these expanded clones uh, in a couple of studies. And so with uh, my NCI colleague, uh, Steve Hughes, we've been trying to uh, study that and see if there's uh, room for an NHP model uh, to address this. And uh, what you're seeing in the circos plot up here is looking at HIV integrations into the human genome versus SIV integrations in the rhesus genome. Uh, and uh, both in vitro and in vivo, there's a striking overlap into the integration sites. And in uh, a recent publication, we documented that uh, the, these, uh, there are indeed expanded clones in SIV-infected rhesus macaques put on art that they are established early within the first weeks of infection, as seems to be the case for HIV-infected people and that they can persist for, uh, so far, uh, more than a year, uh, and uh, that following the human biology, probably multiple years, we just don't have as much follow-up. But in contrast to the human situation, again, we are using this model um, to study, uh, and in interventional studies with extensive tissue sampling, um, the major theories of the underlying biology of the expansion of these clones, in particular, 
uh, whether their proliferation is uh, so-called homeostatic proliferation governed by cytokines and normal biological processes, or whether as some of it uh, reflects antigen-driven proliferation in study designs that you could never even think about trying to do in a, a clinical setting. So when it comes to targeting uh, persistent viruses, I think it's important to validate these models. These are newer models. In particular, I have reservations about uh, there's a lot of interest in evaluating broadly neutralizing antibodies um, as therapy in this setting. Uh, I have my concerns uh, about that um, because while I think most of the shivs have been well established in terms of the acute infection and acute pathogenesis and are great for prevention studies, uh, I'm less convinced that they've been well enough validated for chronic infection and pathogenesis that would be relevant for um, uh, reservoir and cure type studies. I think we as a field have more to do there. Uh, the challenges are that the cost time, especially for these kinds of reservoir and cure type studies, uh, require uh, extended art. And so you're talking about, you know, ideally having animals infected then on treatment for a year before you get to your experiment. And that obviously is time consuming. It occupies cage space. It's expensive. Um, and you need to make sure that you've got clinically rel relevant levels of suppression before you start doing your superimposed uh, interventions. And I think, you know, it's important to acknowledge also uh, what our models are not good for. Uh, I think these uh, kinds of models can be very valuable for certain contexts, but at this point in, in terms of the clinical picture, there's a significant population of folks that have been on antiretroviral therapy for decades. Um, I'm not convinced to the extent that uh, those people may be different than people that have only been on treatment for a year or two years. Um, that uh, we have a model for that or that the models that we're currently using accurately reflect that biology. So that's something else to, to keep in mind. I don't know that uh, it ever will make sense to try and model that in an animal model. So to wrap up, I think uh, non-human primate models have made and continue to make absolutely critical contributions to improving our understanding of disease mechanisms and also developing novel interventions for both prevention and treatment. And I think that um, given uh, appropriate support, um, if we as a field can be thoughtful about uh, the additional studies that we do, including the development and validation of new models, uh, we'll continue to shed light on and giving ourselves a better understanding of disease mechanisms and coming up with improved preventive and therapeutic interventions and, and meeting some of the new and emerging challenges for dealing with HIV AIDS. So, I hope that that uh, sets the stage for some of the presentations uh, to come and uh, looking forward to the rest of the program. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Francois Wellinger, uh, thanks, Jeff, for this quarter review. Uh, for the 239, I'd just like to highlight one, uh, two points. One, and since you were mentioning models, uh, first of all, there's no wild type 239. The clone is what we used as described in the 1991 paper from Kessler et al. from the Roche's lab. It's a molecular clone, there's no wild type, and it's clearly shown that it does uh, restore an F open within uh, at least 10 to 14 days. What uh, the other point is, when you use a wild tap that's open or, or NEF open, we've lost a lot of monkeys, which is extremely expensive, way before we get to the stage of uh, immunotherapy. And I think that's, uh, as I said, it's a model. Yeah. Um, yeah. The last point, I did share how that virus is done with a number of people I gave that stock to. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. No, as I noted, and we very much appreciate that because I think that was a critical aspect of trying to reproduce uh, the study. I, I think the fact that there is a uh, stop codon in it, um, you know, we can debate the, the merits of that as a model separately. I think the, the point that I was trying to make in the context of this presentation is, is that it's important to make sure that, that the published work describes the reagents that were actually used. And I think when you say SIDMAC-239, uh, I don't know anyone else in the field that would consider that uh, to be describing the, the um, NEF uh, closed, NEF stop um, version of the virus. 
And, and so I think uh, to the extent that we can all do a better job, uh, certainly uh, my own lab uh, has room for improvement as, that, as well uh, to better document the viruses that we're using for these studies that would benefit the field as a whole. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll just make a follow-up. Dave O'Connor from Wisconsin that, um, you know, I, I see how a lot of this confusion can arise and Brandon and I worked on the uh, 251 sequence comparison years ago uh, and I think that uh, the key thing is that we need to make sure that whenever we're publishing any of these studies that the sequences of those challenge stocks are clearly defined and made available in public repositories. Like the, the Internet's not going to run out of room uh, to store this sort of stuff. So. Uh, we can do that, and as a, a bit of a shameless plug, uh, many of you know this, but at Wisconsin, uh, we'll actually sequence any virus that goes into monkeys for you for free with the proviso that it goes back uh, into these public repositories so that other people can see that data. And we do that because it is so, so important that the sequences that go into these studies that then become the basis for hugely expensive follow-on studies um, can be fully interrogated by the field. Yeah, I, I agree completely, which is why sequence characterization was one of the criteria in my suggested characterization list. Okay, thank you very much.